uh, talk to you about the first chapter of Genesis. We commonly think of the first chapter of Genesis as being a history of the creation of the world. I'm here to tell you tonight that it's nothing of the sort. Not least because, does anybody know when the sun and moon were created according to the first chapter of Genesis? Day four. When? Day four. Day four. Very clever. So uh, that kind of throws a spanner in the works, doesn't it? If the sun and the moon being planets and all, apart from anything else, were created four days after the world was created. And not least because we have, we have morning and evening, uh, or evening and morning rather I should say, uh, but no sun and no moon for the first three days. So um, this is a bit of a problem if we think of Genesis chapter 1 as being the creation of the world. But if we go to uh, the writings from the Arcana, basically the, the very first page or of the very first volume, we find uh, a different explanation from Swedenborg. From Swedenborg. In most ancient times are called the beginning and are throughout the prophets referred to as the days of antiquity and also the days of eternity. The beginning also embodies within it that first period when a person is being regenerated. For at that time he is being born anew and receiving life. Regeneration itself is then called a new creation of man. Almost everywhere in the prophetic, prof prophetic sections to create, to form, to make, mean to regenerate. Through each of these verbs has a different shade of meaning. Uh, this is the same meaning for all of them. So uh, we find the first verse here saying, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So I've put some, put some pictures up here. We haven't quite got to where the first one is yet, but uh, these, these pictures will help you follow as I speak. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We are not talking about the creation of the world here. Um, it says to us, God created the heaven and the earth. In the book of Jonah, we find God created the sea and the land. So there are all of these various things that God created, but none of them are what we would expect the word to say, the Bible to say, if we were talking about the creation of the world. We would think of planets, we would think of moons, of suns, of stars, we would think of all sorts of other things, none of which we find in Genesis. We find the heaven and the earth were the first things God created. Now what if we were to change our perspective from the creation of the world to the creation of our world within ourself, to the creation of us. As it says here in the writings, as I've just read, the regeneration of us. Now, I grew up in the mainstream Christian church, in the Anglican church, and they all believe and all taught that the Genesis chapter 1 had to do with the creation of the, of the earth, of the world. Um, they also taught that um, salvation for human beings happened straight away in a sudden moment. Um, and that after that, you became a Christian and continued on with your Christian life. I still believe some of that. I believe there is a point in time 
where we make a decision and from that point forward, we uh, begin to have the help to become the kind of person we are meant to be. But also, in, in, in line with what the, the, the writings teach, I believe there is a whole stretching out in our lives of a preparation by God, of laying down foundation within us from our earliest childhood, whether we, whether we finally get saved or not. God is there at the beginning laying down a foundation within us. Uh, Swedenborg calls this foundation remains or remnants. That's the word he uses. Something that has been preserved in us, uh, in our innocence as a child, and something that is then locked away until uh, or if it comes time where we are put in a position where we are offered starts for the regeneration process to begin within us. And in this study that I'm going to do with you tonight, I'm going to show you how the first three days are that preparation period that we undergo. The laying down of a foundation of the, of a, of the knowledge and of the goodness of the Lord. It's not just truth that's laid down, there is a goodness laid down. And the concept of remnants is tied into the idea of the tithing, it's tied into the idea of bread, it's tied into all sorts of other things. It's a huge topic, which really I think in, I, I certainly haven't investigated to its fullness. But that's the first three days. On the fourth day is the beginning of regeneration if we make a decision to go that way and then beyond there life for us begins and that life is represented by the difference between living creatures living animals first the birds and the fish and then the other animals and then finally man i'm only going to get to this point tonight um, but I encourage you to try to read a bit of the, a bit of the things in, in, the, uh, in the Arcana um, that, that, that continue on that period. So the, 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 the Bible tells us, the Word tells us that um, in the beginning, uh, was the, the God created the heaven and the earth that describes for us the fact that we were created not just to be in this world we were created to be in this world and to be in another world to be in a material world with full of things that we can touch and see and, and be involved in and in a spiritual world which for the present time we are unconscious of but we are there. This is the meaning of God created the heavens and the earth. God created these two worlds within us which Swedenborg goes so far as to tell us that we occupy simultaneously even though one of them we are scarcely aware of. If we choose to begin the regeneration process, we will gradually become more and more aware and we will touch on th that process a little bit tonight. Um, but it says to us, It says to us, verse 2, And the earth was void, and emptiness, and there was darkness on the face of the waters. And the Spirit of God was constantly moving on the space of the waters. This is uh, not day two, 
This is the second part we, we, are, we are talking about. Um, the, and uh, there were, um, and the earth, uh, but it, it's so that there's a, 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 a place of darkness. Now, what is darkness? I have got to me, got with me tonight a little box. This is a box of darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, you look in that hole there and tell me if you can see the darkness in there. Ooh. There's definitely darkness in there. Yeah, there's darkness in there. Would you like to have a look and see the darkness? Well. Yeah, can see the darkness? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to open the box and I'm going to show you the darkness. <laughs> That's, there's no darkness in there. That's very strange. <laughs> we'll close it up again. Yeah? Do, can you see the darkness in there? Well, it's definitely in there. It's definitely in there. It's in there. Okay, I'm going to show you the darkness. It fell out where? Huh? It fell out through the hole. It fell out through the hole. <laughs> if anything, it, it, dripped, it dripped out. <laughs> Okay, so what does this tell us? What is darkness truly? The absence of light. The absence of light. It's not, darkness is not a thing. It doesn't exist. It is the absence of light. So when it says that the, the earth was void and emptiness and there was darkness on the, spa on the face of the, of the abyss, the um, what it is saying is there was literally nothing. There was, the, there was less than nothing. There was the absence of something um, there. And that is how we are to God before uh, he begins to play a role in our lives. But it says... Um, God was constantly moving over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God was constantly moving over the face of the waters. And that word moving is very significant. If any of you have ever done any Bible studies, whether in the new church or in any other church, you'll probably have heard that that word can be interpreted as brooding like a chicken or hovering like a chicken does over her eggs or over her chickens. And the, the image that is for us, given to us there, is that God hovers over us and hovers over us in love. So that is the first thing that happens. Not that we love God and that we discover God, but that God loves us long before Amen. we had the capacity to do that. But God says, let there be light. The first step that is taken when we begin to realize that goodness and truth, that what is good and what is true is transcendent. People who focus in the external world, who live in the external world, do not even know what is good and true. The writings tell us that for them, whatever is helps them to get ahead, helps them to gain wealth, helps them to be successful, is good. It doesn't matter how they do it. And whatever supports their efforts, whatever knowledge supports their efforts to do these things is true. There is no independent sense of what is good and true. Now, of course, most people um, are able to give you uh, the idea that they do understand that there needs to be an independent sense of what is good and true. But in, in, the, in the depth of their 
heart in their life, they, have, they do not have the power to really do what is good and true. They, they are aware of it, they know it, they can tell you that they know it, but ultimately they are not able to do it on their own. Um, anything that gives the advantage, they, they think of good. Anything that allows them to take advantage of that advantage, they consider true. When we first become aware that good is not good, we begin to advance. We begin to become aware that there is something above this world which we live in. In uh, many people uh, say to me, uh, John chapter one verse one also talks uh, about in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was present with God, and the Word was God, and everything was made by Him, and nothing that was made was made without Him, um, and life was the light of humankind. You can see this in a completely different part of the Bible in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament. You can see this picking up the same thought that is in that is in Genesis. Once again, confirming to us that Genesis is not about the, this, a scientific experiment, the creation of the world. It is about the establishment in our lives of what is good and true and ultimately the beginnings of regeneration. And God saw that the light was good. And God made a distinction between the light and the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Mm. <coughs> See, Martin, there's no sun or moon yet. No sun or moon. No. Nothing. For all we know, there's not even any rotation of the earth. Um, so um, God is breaking in to that darkness, to that nothingness, to that absence. God is breaking in as light. Now, what does this mean? Well, we know that light, according to the writings, light is truth and heat or warmth is good. God is breaking into that darkness with truth. And, God, and uh, the writings teach us that the way God operates is that he comes to us first in truth. And that that truth begins to reform us, reorient us, um, bring about a sense of our need for repentance, and then ultimately as I go, go on, you will, we will see, become a container. And what will fill that container? Good. Good will come into that truth and fill that container, but that container has to be there first. And so truth comes to us first, light comes to us first. And there was an evening and there was morning the first day. What lies between evening and morning? Night. Night. Night, exactly. And yet each of the days we are told, and there was evening and there was morning the second day, evening, morning the third day, evening, morning the fourth day, etc. Why do you think it's written that way? I'll tell you why. It's because there must be an end to our previous state, to our previous situation, before a new morning situation can begin. But it's another example of how this is not a story about the creation of the world. This is a story about the creation of us. So the, the new day, the second day, is the expanse between the waters. God created an expanse 
between the waters. And he said, let there be an expanse in the middle of the waters and let it exist to make a distinction among the waters, in the waters. And God made the expanse and he made a distinction between the waters that were under the expanse and the waters that were over the expanse. And so it was done. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Now one of the interesting things about Genesis chapter 1 is we, is we have the distinction being made. The distinction between the heaven and the earth. The distinction between uh, the light and the darkness. And now the distinction between, between the waters, the waters above and the waters below. So there's a distinction being made between them. Now, the reason why this is happening is because when you distinguish things, you make them easier to grasp. If you just have a whole mess of stuff, imagine a pile of stuff on your floor, and you're looking at it, and you're thinking, where is my wallet? Or where is my purse? <laughs> or where is my phone? <laughs> if you go to and tidy that up and separate it out, then you will be able to see where your wallet or where your phone is, or where that shirt you were looking for last week that you were so annoyed because you couldn't find and you wanted to wear it out. <laughs> And so this is what a distinction does. It allows us to see things in a way that we were not able to do before. And so we have this distinction process going on. Um, but we also have a problem. We have these two bodies of water, so it appears, and then we have a space between them and it's called heaven. Why is it called heaven? You would think that heaven would be up here somewhere, above the waters, you know, but no, heaven is between the waters. Now, in part, we are, we are of course, talking about the great balance between heaven and hell. You will know, if you're familiar with the writings, that God places us in a position where hell below and heaven above have an, have an equal um, influence over us. So that the only difference is our choice between whether we listen, whether we hear what heaven is doing, or whether we hear what hell is doing, whether we're attracted to one or the other. Now that's true, that it does, it does apply to this, but of course we are not really at that, that the point where we're choosing yet of what is happening between. So I, I was thinking about this for a long time, many weeks, and uh, one of the books that I'm reading now, I, from time to time I, I read well-known books, great books, books of history, and uh, for the last uh, year or two now I've been reading the Tao Te Ching. Some of you will be familiar with that. And in the Tao Te Ching, there is a discussion. Uh, what did I do with my pen? There's, there's a dis there is a, a, a point where it discusses the idea of a wheel with spokes. And it says, that is a wheel. But it says, what makes that wheel useful? And what makes it useful is this hole in the middle. It's, the, it's an empty space in the middle of that wheel. And why does that make it useful? Because that is where it attaches to the cart. And then once it's attached to the cart, the cart can carry things. Then the Tao Te Ching goes on to say again, we have a pot. A little 
handles on it like that. And that is made out of clay, and we can make that one of those out of clay. But what is it that makes that pot useful? It's not just the decoration, it may have lovely designs on it, you know, but what truly makes it useful? The space within it. Yeah, that is where we can put things, wide or grain or something like that. Then the Tao Te Ching goes on once again and it says we have a house with windows and doors. Could be a very nice looking house. But what is it that makes that house useful? What is it that gives that house value to us? Because what it is, of course, is that we can go in and live in that house, the space in the house is what, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that, that's so beautiful. Um, it, goes to, it goes on to talk about how, uh, you know, there's, there's so much in the reality of that emptiness that tra transforms. We deal with the outward parts. But in our spiritual lives, it's the inward parts that make us useful, truly useful to God. Um, and I think, I believe that this, this emptiness here is where um, our, our, our usefulness, our use, our service, our love, our giving, our interacting, our relationships. These are the things, these so-called empty things, they can't be measured, they can't be touched, they can't be seen, but they are what make us useful. Um, and so, and that is why they're also heaven, because ultimately is what flows to us through heaven, through the what seems to be the emptiness. We are, I mean, we are, we are complete void, but that emptiness that exists there is the opposite of void. It is substance, but it's not material. And so uh, this was the, um, this was the uh, making of the second day, of the, begin, uh, of the second day, yeah. Um, and then God, then we get uh, to the second half of the second day and we discover, um, no, sorry, we get to the third day. Third day is the creation of plants. But what first happens on the third day, Genesis chapter no, uh, verse nine, and God said, "Let the waters under the heaven, literally these waters here, under the heaven, be gathered together in one place, and let dry land appear." Now this is a very peculiar statement uh, because dry land uh, doesn't really appear until what? Let me take you to a verse um, Exodus chapter 14 verse 21 Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea all the night and the Lord rose back the sea with a strong wind that turned it into dry land. And you know, that was the time when the Lord was leading the people of Israel across the Red Sea um, to, to get, let them escape from the Pharaoh. Um, but he is driving the sea back. But in this verse... God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. 
and fall dry land. It's completely opposite. One more reason why the first chapter of Genesis is not talking about the creation of the world. It's talking about the creation of something in us. Now, what is being created in us? Dry land is being created in us. Earth uh, is being um, made. Um, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. Once again, notice the separation, the earth from the from the waters and God saw that it was good now how do we explain this well the writing quote a verse here from um, they quote the, the a passage from the gospels the kingdom of God is like a man casting seed upon the ground and sleeping and rising night and day and the seed sprouts and springs up and he knows not how for the earth bears fruit of itself. First the blade and then the ear and then the full corn of the ear. And possibly many of us have heard of the parable of the sower. The sower went out and he threw seed on different types of ground. Some of it was hard ground and the seed died. Some of it was weedy ground and the seed was suffocated. Um, and then some of it was good ground. So how does Swedenborg define this ground? What is its correspondence in us? What does it indicate in us? Well, it indicates our ability to receive and the church, yeah, but particularly our ability, we, we, uh, we come to a place where we are able to receive things from God. Now, this is another interesting, there's another interesting idea here. When, in these places here, in the waters and in the, in the darkness and the various things, God is talking about us in a, a group sense. We are not really distinguished within ourselves between us and between others. We are ruled by forces that rule others around us. We have reputation, um, uh, our concern about what others think of ourselves, our comparison with, with the way we look and with the way others look. We are, we are in many ways indistinguishable from others in the world. And we sometimes think, oh, if I accept what God tells me, I'll need to change and I'll, I will become less than what I was before. I will become less of a person because I will have to be good. And nobody likes a goody goody. <laughs> no fun. <laughs> no fun. Absolutely. We like you. Who are you going to go to the pub with if, if your friend turns into a goody goody? You know. <laughs> and we worry. And and people, if you get the chance to to speak to them, you know, one of the big things that will be in their mind is how will I be good? How will I? How will I change my life based on the truth, the truth that I hear? I, I, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can be that. And besides that, I, I, I want to be me. You know, I'm good. I'm, I want to be me. You know, and all the time, in reality, we are not me. We're what everybody else around us thinks we should be. We are not distinct. We are not able to separate ourselves from others and what they do. We are caught up in that world, in this world. We are caught up in the rat race. 
that, you know. God wants to make us more than everyone else. He wants to make us into something that we never imagined that we could be. He wants, us, he wants to make us into something that is not just distinct from the rest of the world, but is wonderful, powerful. He doesn't want us to be less than we were before. He wants us to be more than we were before, and so much more than we were before. We cannot imagine how wonderful, how great God wants us to be. Because we were empty and void. We were the darkness that is just a absent. We are absent. We have a God-shaped hole in us, but we are, we are absent. There's nobody home in a very real sense. But God wants to take of himself and fill us with that. What he's taking from himself is perfectly designed to fit in. It is quite literally a new self based on our original self. Where does he get the design for the new self he wants us to be? From ourselves. Perfectly tailored. Designed to fit. Designed to make us what he always meant us to be. This is the meaning of this uh, this reception, our ability to receive. And God said, let the earth cause the sprouting on the earth of the tender plant, of the plant bearing its seed, of the fruit of the tree, making the fruit that holds its seed. The tender plant, the plant bearing its seed, the fruit of the tree making being the fruit that holds the seed. There's three things here, three things, and they are following on one from each other. Um, the, the plant, the plant bearing seed, the plant is like the leaf. The plant bearing seed is like the, the shrub that has seed in it and the tree bearing fruit is like the full grown things and God is, is talking about what can grow out of that um, that uh, earth that ground which he has placed within us The fruitfulness, the fruitfulness, the fruitfulness of the grass, the fruitfulness of the seed, the fruitfulness of the of the tree. <laughs> That's day three. Now we come to day four, the creation of the sun and the moon. How strange it is that so many people think Genesis chapter 1 is about the creation of the world. One of the funniest, most amusing things, but of course you shouldn't laugh at people, but one of the most amusing things is to ask people what day was the sun and moon created on? Because nine times out of ten, they do not know. And they may have read their Bible all their lives. They may have gone to Sunday school. They may have gone to church. Nine times out of ten, they will not know what day 
the earth, the sun and the moon was created on. Because in their minds, they are so convinced that this is a scientific progression of the creation of the earth. It's nothing of the sort. So why are the sun and moon made on the fourth day? AC, the arcana tells us, the progress of faith in those who are being created in you is as follows. Initially, such people are without any life, as no life exists, only what is false. False. Afterwards, they receive life from the Lord through faith. The first form of faith to bring life is a mes uh, memorized thing, a, a fact. The next faith is in the intellect, uh, an understanding, and the last faith is in the heart, born of love, of saving truth. However, however, in verses 3 to 13, the things mentioned have no living soul. They represent only the factual faith in the world around them. So they are things that we are drawing in from the world around them. Now, and the writings are unique in their teaching that we can see in the world things that bring us to God, that we are able to do that. Most other churches will say, no, turn your back on the world, the rid of the world, the world is an evil, evil place, not the writings. The writings say that the truths of our God are available to us through the world. So there is no excuse for someone to say, oh, I, I never had a chance, I never heard, went to Sunday school or read the Bible or any of these other things. They can see in the world the things that are important. God can bring them to their attention. Um, but those things on their own are not sufficient to begin the regeneration process. The regeneration process begins when we get to the fourth day, when we get the sun and the moon. After the lights are kindled and placed in the inner self, the outer self is receiving light from them. The time arrives when we first start to live. Mm. This is the sun and the moon. Earlier, we can hardly be said to have been alive, thinking as we did that good, the good we performed and the truth we spoke originated in ourselves. On our own, we are dead and have nothing but evil and falsity inside, with the result that nothing we produce from ourselves has life. So true is this that by our own power we cannot do anything good. Not anything inherently good. As long as our thinking ran along these lines, the truth and goodness we pro pro possess were equated with tender the tender grass, the plant-bearing seed, and the fruit-bearing tree, none of which has a living soul. Now, when love and faith have brought us to life, we believe that the Lord brings about all the good we do and the truth we speak. We are compared initially to creeping animals, waters, birds, etc., which we're going on in, the, in day five here. So this, the, the sun and the moon, we, we can interpret that the sun produces heat and warmth, and that is good, and the, the moon has no heat, but it has life, light, and we know that light is truth. So we have a process going on here where the sun and the moon appear in our lives. Uh, and uh, and it, uh, that is the Lord coming to us um, at that point. And then after that, we come to a place uh, where 
for the first time, um, we see living things. And God said, let the waters cause the creeping animals, the fish, the living soul to creep out and let the bird flit over the land and over the face of the expanse of the heavens. And God created the sea creatures and every living creeping soul that the waters cause to creep on their kinds. Uh, so we have the... Creep, the creeping creatures that creep along the ground and we have the uh, other things that we have the birds these are living truths the fish is in the natural world around us um, and the birds are in the, in the skies above us and they differentiate between uh, the things that we um, uh, are more, more, more fact-like than the birds, things that are more spiritual coming together. Um, and so um, this this is a point that I really want to stress here. When I came into the new church, um, I'd grown up in, in a traditional Christian church. And one of the things I, I had experienced, I had experienced a, a point in my life where someone spoke to me and said, uh, the Lord demands that you come to a place in your life where you perform a transaction with him. You offer him your life and he promises you to take that offering that you're making to him, to take that gift that you are giving him and to fill it with his power and with his love and with the, the perfectly matched creation of you. He comes to you in your own form and he empowers you and he, he fills you with his spirituality which is true substance, true reality, which is something real but it's perfectly tailored to you. When I came into the writings, uh, I never saw the word, the name Jesus mentioned very much. And I never saw the word Christian used very much. But over and over and over again, I saw this point of decision it's, it's a transaction. And sometimes I think that with the writings, we can get lost in the idea that there's so much to know, so much to think about. And we can think to ourselves, well, when will I ever get to the end of it? I'll never get to the end of it. I'll just keep having to learn. And, 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 and that can be a mistake. We can think that the getting to God can be an impossible thing of learning all the writings and of learning what they tell us and of trying to do what they tell us. But ultimately, it's no different than anybody else. We have to come face to face with the Lord. Um, and we have to make that transaction with Him. We have to make that offering and we have to, to recognize our need to have him take uh, in our lives. Um, and it says here uh, about, the, about the whole of the writings of Swedenborg, it says, in all that follows, the name of the Lord is used exclusively. Wherever the Lord is mentioned in the writings of Swedenborg, it means the Saviour of the world, 
Jesus Christ. And he is called the Lord without the addition of the rest of his names. He needs no other name. Um, throughout heaven, he is acknowledged and worshipped as the Lord, since he has all power in heaven and on earth. Um, and this, the, the, the basis of our life is a, um, a divine being who came down and became a man, just like we are, and became a human born on earth, just like we are. And while the writings may be filled with the most wonderful truths, and they are, they are the greatest book ever written next to the Bible. We must not get lost in those truths and lose sight of the fact that we are still dealing with a man, with a, with a God who took on flesh and blood and lived among us. And that is who we approach. That is who we mean when we talk about the Lord. So tonight I genuinely want you to consider that fact. And if there's perhaps a, uh, you feel a need to, to come back and to reaffirm that idea in your mind, I would like to think that some, th some of the things I've said tonight would be a help to you to reconsider whether you stand in that position um, and to, to know that first and foremost, beyond the history that the Bible gives us, beyond the promises that it makes, beyond the things that it teaches us, is that idea that its, it's number one purpose is to bring us into a relationship with God that we can understand and that we can um, come to know. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, there's 10 minutes for questions. Any questions? Well, I was hoping you were going to have some fish in a box for us. <laughs> Why fish? meanings there's a earthly meaning yes. there's a spiritual meaning yes. there's a celestial meaning yes what you're talking about there was that the spiritual or celestial or was it both all three all three mm. okay so uh, god descended into the physical is that what you called it the yeah the the, the earth level so that he could be relevant on that level he um became the truth so that he could be relevant on the spiritual level through his spirit his spirit is sent his spirit is him in a invisible form um, and he uh, became also a source of the power from the celestial and the love from the celestial realm i was thinking it's it says that if you're an angel in the spiritual kingdom you will understand the Bible uh, different to the angels which are in the celestial kingdom. Yes. So wouldn't the angels in the celestial kingdom have a a overall a better understanding because he will have the higher light? So, uh, so the way yeah. the way is We are spiritual when we obey the, rule, the laws that we know are good and, and are right. We've, we've come to the Lord. We've been 
uh, you know, through the, the fourth day, um, but we are not, um, we're not at the point where we're really loving him. We're still obeying him. We're still at the point where we're trying to obey him. We're trying to live by truth, living truth, but truth all the same. The celestial level, we get beyond truth, as it were. We come into a place of love. So the, the difference between them, to, between them, and you are right, they are different, is that one is living for the Lord on the basis of the truth that he teaches us, and the next one is living for the Lord on the basis of the love that we feel from him. So all the writings, uh, we would say, they are containing all three the, the physical or the earthly, the spiritual and the celestial. Yes. If, therefore, to my thinking is, if we are either, hopefully everyone here is either in a spiritual or a celestial manner, therefore, doesn't it mean that some of us here will get a, get one meaning and some others will get the other. So if, if I love goodness more than anything else, am I getting a, different message than if I love truth? No, you, you, you're getting a better understanding of that message. Um, if you understand something because you know that uh, it is true, that's, that's one thing. If you understand something because you love it, that's a whole different thing. You, for example, might know about coins, a uh, coin collection. You might have a coin collection. You know about coins. You know all sorts of details and instructions about them. Um, but then you might meet someone else who's just besotted with coins, you know, and he knows twice as much as you do, and yet, yet he's been learning for the same period of time. And you say, well, how do you know twice as much as I do? And he says, well, I get up in the morning, and I just want to look at my coins. And then I come home for lunch, and I just can't go back to work without looking at my coins. And then when I get home in the evenings, I just get my coins out again. You know, he's... He's, he knows more than you, not because he necessarily knows different things, although he probably does, but he, he is driven to know it. You know a lot, but it's because you like coins and you like the ideas that you learn about them, but you don't, you're not um, obsessed, you could say, with them. Do you understand the difference there? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh. Okay. Yeah, I once heard that expressed uh, in a useful way, which helped me to understand difference, that to live according to a truth, uh, the way it was expressed was that we live according to something and, and so we are obeying it. Yes. But there is a difference between that and living from it. Living from that truth is to wholeheartedly have it within you. Yeah. And you willingly, your will has then acquired that lovingness for teachings that you want to embody it and wholeheartedly get from it. So that was a difference, a subtle difference in language yeah. that helped me to see the different levels. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit like looking after your own child or looking after someone else's child. You, you, can sh you can be as much protective and caring as someone else's child, but your own child, it, it's like a whole new level. And that's like the difference between a um, spiritual Christian and a celestial Christian. That you own it, basically. It, it becomes more important to you than anything else. Any other questions? Yeah, what's the right things uh, are emphasizing? Uh, most of the right things are emphasizing the spiritual point of view. But we as a human beings, we look at the physical point of view. And we 
we see earth, we see earth, and when we see sun or moon, we picture it uh, in a physical format. But whereas all the writings of Swedenborg is bring, trying to bring us, when we see the light, it doesn't mean this light. He was the light inside us. Enlightenment. Uh, enlightenment, exactly. So uh, this is what uh, the awakening uh, brings into us. If we have the spiritual understanding of the spiritual uh, movement, we are able to see the truth differently. So uh, the inner, the inner. The inner, the inner light. In the where does the thing, where do the things in the world come from? Yes. They come from the original truth. Each one of them. Yes. And, and so, so to see the inner truth, the inner spiritual thing, as you say, of something, yes. is to see where it originally came from. Yes. So we are in alignment with the divine thought when you move through the spiritual plan. Right. When you were talking about. Um, becomes connected that creates something firm yes. 
into which exactly uh, the opportunity for things to grow and, yes. and come into being comes about. So yeah, that's a yeah. Thanks. And, it, and really, it's an identity that's separate. I talked to you about the way before the Lord comes into our life, we are, as it were, one of a crowd. You know, even. In the old-fashioned days, the missionaries could go to the chief of the tribe and they could say, follow Jesus. And the chief of, chief of the tribe decided he would follow Jesus and everyone in the tribe would follow Jesus. They were a complete organism, almost a unit in themselves. But today, God, I believe, has brought us to the place where we have independent independence. It's easier for us to become what God wants us to be, which is each one of us being a, a different uh, glory of his, a different uh, independent representation of something about the infinite des divine in the finite creation. God's got a thought on the, uh, the grass and the trees. Mm. Yeah, for me, I'm getting with branches, the strong branches hold the thoughts. Mm. Now, me personally, I think it, I did it <laughs> the other way. I started reading the word and the writings, and I started strengthening the branches. Because the branches weren't holding up very good. Now, what I'm getting here is a lot of the world, people living in the world, are they nourishing the branches in the wrong way? Do they just snap? Or you're getting people that are nourishing the word without not doing it. Like I think of people that don't even believe in God. They're doing the, their branches, man, they're strong as they're evergreens that would start withstand anything. So they're doing the work. Yes. Uh, yes. The strength. So the discipline. Yeah. So. Yeah. So people are, who are, like you said in the start, who are mm. nourishing themselves by mm. the wor word. Mm. So by the end of it, if they're not nourishing those branches, those thoughts with the light and the water, mm. they're snapping. Mm. Um, I don't know. So can I dementia? I don't know. I don't can know. I suggest to you what's what's weighing down the branches? The birds. Mm. The birds are coming and nesting. So they're the thoughts, the birds. Yes. It's what you're what but, you're attracting. I guess. But they're more than that. They are the life. So you can have very strong branches, but not be in the regeneration process. And it, it's the birds flying into your branches and landing on them that brings the regeneration process to you. The life. You've got long fruit, I guess. Mm. Yeah, bad birds. Yeah, bad birds. I mean, dark birds. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's a possibility. But more likely, it's just that your branches are empty. They're strong, but they're empty. They're not serving their purpose. So I didn't mean to own a can of worms. It's just um, uh, I don't see any worms. <laughs> are they nourishing today? Any other, any other questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you so much for having me. Let's, let's say a pray, uh, prayer mm. and, and, and thank Martin for... Uh, Dear Lord, thank you for giving this talk to Martin and giving it to us tonight. We are so appreciative of, of that word. And we thank you, Lord, for sending your, your lovely people here tonight to listen. We truly are grateful for all that you give and do for us. And Lord, the food there, bless it to our bodies. Mm. May we nourish our bodies and our hearts together as your people. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.